We all struggle with feeling like there's not enough time in the day to be productive personally or professionally. We all struggle to make our time matter. It's time to take control. It's time to start investing in the corporation of you. At Athena, they've helped over 700 ambitious professionals achieve more by connecting them with best in class globally remote executive assistants. Athena executive assistants go beyond basic administration tasks. They help you make time matter through the art of delegation. They believe delegation is the superpower of all highly successful people. And your personal EA will help you get there. Your EA is a one on one long term partner to help you achieve your personal and professional goals. Take back your time. Join the waitlist at athenago.com. That's athenago.com. Patients in the United States have the legal right to request and receive copies of our medical records. But the thing about those portals is hospitals decide what you can see in them. From Offscript Media, I am Matthew Zachary, and this is Out of Patience. You know, I've never said the words cancer nerd and Google scholar in succession before, but that only partially describes the epicness of my guest today, one Liz Salmi, self-proclaimed citizen scientist and professional medical nerd. And I attest that both of those are appropriate, accurate, and deserved. Diagnosed with brain cancer at 29 and forced down a rabbit hole of a whole bunch of other horrible shit, Liz became the accidental advocate we needed when the interweb was just becoming the internet and when the online support communities that we take for granted today barely existed. Her self-made background in digital comms came in very handy when she realized her higher purpose in becoming a human babblefish capable of helping clinicians and academics speak person in understandable layperson language. She's also the founder of the BTSM community on Twitter, inspired by the patients and researchers who had come together for the BCSM tweet chats in 2011, and for the acronym jargony nerds out there that's brain tumor social media and breast cancer social media. Liz is a force, the hero we deserve, the nerd we need, and man does she love her patient portals, said no one ever but her. Join me in also celebrating her 12th Brain Cancer Anniversary, right here today on the show. Enjoy. Liz Salmi, welcome to Out of Patience. We're old school for like literally OG, mega OG, young adult cancer advocate people drafted into the cancer verse that we didn't ask to be a part of. I love that you call yourself a citizen scientist and a professional medical nerd. Kind of feel the same way from a different perspective because we didn't ask to have those LinkedIn qualifiers on our bio, you know, 15 years ago. But just to level set for the listeners, you know, we we have known each other a billion years. You were diagnosed at 29 with brain cancer. I didn't know a lot of brain cancer people even when I entered the fray. And you were like, you, I'm sorry you joined that to be my friend, but let's go through how that all started. What were your symptoms? You had life just going where it was going and bang. Yeah. In uh, summer 2008, I celebrated my 29th birthday. I had just started a brand new job. Uh, things were awesome. My background is in digital communications. And then I was at work at my brand new job and I suffered this massive seizure. I had no other seizures in my life before, so I didn't know what was happening. Uh, jumping forward many minutes and hours later, I and landed in the emergency department where a scan showed I had a mass in my brain, which led to the recommendation of surgery. After a nine hour surgery, we learned that I have a slow growing but malignant brain tumor or brain cancer called astrocytoma. After that, uh, six months later, that tumor grew back and it sent me into a whole bunch of treatments over the next two years, including continued seizures and having to deal with seizures, physical and occupational therapy, relearning how to walk and balance, 24 months of chemotherapy. And it was a quick learning process. Suddenly I had become an expert in neurology to manage my care. And so that's how it all started for me. And how, how I actually met you was you know, when you're 29 and you have brain cancer, you don't know who else, anyone else who's gone through the same experience. And I had Googled and on the interwebs and found and learned about a group called Stupid Cancer. 
and learned that its founder, Matthew Zachary, was also a person who was living with and surviving from brain cancer. And I reached out on the Facebooks, searched for your name, found you and said, can I, can I be your friend so I can have another friend with brain cancer? And thankfully, you accepted my friend request. So that is my and your origin story with me. It is a bizarre little niche market, brain cancer, even still. I feel like it's always the outlier of all the oncology narrative out there. Do you still feel that way? Absolutely. You know, uh, there's about 1% to 2% of all cancers are a brain tumor, and there are 130 different types of brain tumors. And over the last 40 years, there have only been four FDA-approved therapies for people with brain tumors. So it is, it's a loss leader. There, there aren't as many uh, interventions that get accepted by the FDA. So drug companies don't really get a lot of bang for their buck if they invest in our cancer. So there's a lot more work to be done in that space. Yeah, I kind of agree. And I, despite or in spite of even joining this young adult cancer universe, I, I just statistically, it's largely hematologic and breast cancer. I just think that's the innate nature of the biology in our age group. But I never really felt like I did enough as homage to who were the young adult cancer, young adult brain cancer folks out there that needed to feel like they belonged to something. And as much as we struggled, really, really, really did our best to connect to these universes together, it was always like we never felt like we belonged. And because it's above the head, you can't really see inside your brain. It's a different planet. Literally, like you can't remove your brain. It's not something you could just get amputated. You know, right. It's, there is a certain co continuity of alienation when you have something in your brain. Well, you don't just have cancer. You have also a neurological condition. So when you're trying to connect with other folks, sometimes the people you connect with are other young people with cancer, other people with cancer. But oftentimes I found folks in the neurological maladies. I, I feel like I relate to you know, aspects of what it's like to have a stroke, um, folks with epilepsy. So you, you kind of have to draw from a variety of, of disciplines and maladies to connect with other people. And you know, considering there's a smaller group of folks living with brain tumors and brain cancer, it's harder to run across them, especially back in the day. And now you know, we have all these online platforms to connect with more people and find each other. Yeah. And you entered the community, you know, again, it's like you didn't wake up and say, can't wait to have brain tumor one day and then join this community. You had a background in digital comm. It's just as the interwebs became the internet. And yes. at the dawn of all this insanity, it was a blessing that we were there for you to meet and join the young adult cancer community. And that again, the, the rare brain cancer, young adult space that we migrated to as, as magnets to each other. But what was available to you at the time, you know, in, in 2012, whenever it was like that, like what was happening back then? I don't even remember. Yeah. I, so I have um, this, I don't want to say hypothesis. I have a view. Um, we talk about generations of people. So there's the, the boomers and the Gen X and the millennials and so forth. But I think there are generations of patients, not based off of your age, but based off of the time period in which you entered healthcare and had something serious you had to deal with. And depending on you know what decade you entered healthcare, people respond differently to medical conditions. So for example, we are not the same, you and I and, and anyone after us are not the same patients of the 1950s who say, doctor knows best. Um, in 2007, Apple introduced the iPhone, which quickly became the world's easiest way to get to the web and look up information. And so for me, I was diagnosed one year later in 2008, and it became easy for me to Google anything and try to find an answer. So my whole healthcare experience has been colored and shaped by a new culture of easy access to information. And as we move forward in time, new products and platforms popped up to make it possible for people to not just find quote unquote answers or do their own quote unquote research, lowercase r research, but also connect with other people and platforms, social media, um, other platforms to connect and share with each other about their lived patient experience. So we could get not just information from our doctors, but also external sources, hopefully good quality sources of information, but also with patients to share it, you know, life hacks with each other because my doctor, while she's awesome, doesn't know what a it feels like to take the chemotherapy I was on. So we were augmenting our 
in-clinic hospital experiences, along with this crowdsource hive mind of what it's like to be a patient. Yeah, I mean, I feel like when I started Stupid Cancer, I think I had a MySpace page was the closest thing we had. <laughs> Friendster was sunsetting itself for some reason. And then Obama... <laughs> in his 2007 bid for uh, for his nomination was on the Facebook. And yes. I'm like, what is this Facebook thing? I'm like, all right, <laughs> I'll join it. Why not? And which is why, well, back then, Stupid Cancer was called I'm Too Young for This. And we had a Facebook page before we even knew what to do with it. This was pre-Twitter. And yeah. like you said, everything is kind of like digital rose-colored glasses as to when you enter the marketplace. And... Yeah, I was in 96 that we barely had plumbing in 1996. Yeah. So let, let alone <laughs> well, antiemetics and all those fancy things we take for granted today. Right. Well, it's interesting. I, I, I've been listening to your podcast nonstop for the last week leading up to our conversation today to make sure I'm current. And I, I would highly recommend folks to listen to your interview with Matt Holt, who was talking about health 1.0, 2.0, and the digital revolution, which is really informative history to maybe what we might be talking to about today. And then I just listened to the new podcast that dropped about the special series with hashtag BCSM or breast cancer social media, which is about the launch of Twitter as a community for folks living with breast cancer. And I'm part of a community, BTSM, for brain tumor social media on Twitter, where we've been, you know, we were inspired by breast cancer social media and thought, wow, they're doing this thing where they're getting folks to get breast cancer, where they're patients, care partners, clinicians, and researchers. And we wanted to do the same thing in brain tumors. And we've been doing that since 2013, and it's continued to grow. And we've been able to not just observe in, in a similar way, the breast cancer community has been evolving over time on this platform. Uh, the brain tumor community is in parallel, while a much smaller group um, has been evolving in a really similar way. And it's been so fun to be a co-organizer of that, along with seven other brain tumor individuals. It's really cool. Yeah, you beat me to the punch because, yes, we did. As of this recording, we just launched our BCSM uh, micro series, analoging when Twitter goes right by accident. And people say, what's all this then? And something happens. So to see, and, and this is not in any way a copycat. This is the idea that patients could take advantage of something in the Matt Holt digital 2.0 syllable stuff that actually was something we built and needed for ourselves. And I've been fascinated, like my fake anthropology hat that I don't really have a degree in, to see how the patients life hacked their way through the digital health emergence to get what they needed that just wasn't there anywhere else. And I was there when BCSM started. I was there when BTSM started. I was there when LCSM, lung cancer, started. And then, of course, AYACSM, the young Adolescent mm -hmm. Young Adult Cancer Societal uh, Movement. Not, so, not, not society because it was Canadian. Societal Movement. Thank you. Shout mm -hmm. out to Emily Drake for the societal part of our acronym. <laughs> it has been a stunning exercise in how people that are drafted into a community they never expected to be in have figured out the best ways to self-police, self-navigate, and learn from each other. Absolutely. And it's it's been interesting. So we'll get into it, but I've been kind of slowly morphing into this patient slash researcher role as I, I get more nerdy about these very topics. And with the brain tumor social media community, We've been working on our own research of what's happening on Twitter and how these relationships between, um, you know, Twitter is a flat platform. You don't already have to be friends with people on Twitter to follow them and engage with them. And so what we've seen with the brain tumor community is more clinicians and researchers are wondering, oh, what's going on there with the, brain, the, the patient community? How might we learn with them? And we've partnered on a number of of papers published in the actual journals, uh, the, the medical literature around this community and as it develops over time. And we've noticed how the, the use of the hashtag originally was just patients, and it's not owned by anyone. We're not part of some nonprofit or anything. We're just a group of patients running our own community, very similar to BCSM. But we've seen how from 2013 uh, through 2019, how more real organizations like the National Institutes of Health and the National Cancer Institute and MD Anderson have started using this hashtag as a way to get 
research and information specific to folks with brain tumors, you know, on the radar of the Twitter community. So it's not just random patients using this hashtag, but it's being picked up by real established institutions because they recognize it's a way to get to the audience that they're trying to speak to and with. Back with our guest after the break. Has your chronic illness made it difficult to continue working in the traditional way? Want to learn how to find and create flexible remote work that both accommodates your chronic illness and generates an income? Join the Patients Getting Paid membership, a community of chronicpreneurs where people just like you find workshops and trainings, weekly updated condition-specific gigs, twice-monthly coaching calls, co-workings, accountability, and the kindest community to support you on your path to make money while working from anywhere and taking good care of yourself. Learn more or join us at patientsgettingpaid.com. So Liz, I really want to point out something that I've been unnervingly envious of you for, because if you do a Google search for you, I found out that you're a Google scholar. And what (laughs) have I done wrong in my life to not be a Google scholar? I I love that you're asking this question. I've been learning so much just in the last year. I I want to just go out to tell all of the patient advocates all of you can be researchers, by the way, if you if you so desire. Uh, research, academia is wants to partner with you and they don't know how. So if you've ever just desired to, to have a taste of what is the research life like, it's cool now for researchers to partner with patients. And if you're already an advocate, you are a conduit to other patients to collaborate. I mean, if you're a patient advocate, you're a natural community organizer and research needs you. I feel like I just got on a soapbox real fast. Now I'm going to step down from the soapbox and actually answer your question. So Google Scholar is kind of like a quasi LinkedIn, quasi PubMed for researchers. And so you can go to google.scholar.com and you end up in the academic literature space um, search version of Google. And so you get a, a Google search box that just looks like regular Google and you enter any topic you're looking for real research on. It could be, um, you know, cures for brain cancer or epilepsy drugs or, or a really specific search term straight from your medical record. And you'll end up with all the results of published papers, real peer reviewed papers on that topic. In addition to that, and seeing that list and clicking and trying to find the research, you could also look up individual authors of research papers. So it could be, you know, Anthony Fauci, you throw his name in there and look him up and see all of the papers that he's authored. And then if you are a researcher, you can actually create your own profile or claim your profile and then link it to the the papers you've been authored on. This sounds really nerdy now that I'm talking (laughs) about it right now. Um, but, But I'd say, you know, when you said, how did you do that? Too long, didn't read, but I am now a baby researcher. I have about you know 15 citations that have my name on it, which is exciting because I used to have zero. Um, but I realized you can claim your author profile. And so you, there's a little bit of vetting, but you claim your profile and then you can add a picture and then you know, and, you know your research areas of interest. So if you have ever had your name on a published paper, go search for yourself at search.google.com and then claim your profile. So that's how you, you end up in there. On the next exciting episode of How to Be a Google Scholar with Liz Salmi. <laughs> I, you know, whenever I have guests on, I, I always try to observe whether they're actually doing what they studied in undergraduate or graduate school. (laughs) And you're one of the few that are. And you came into the cancer world having a background in digital comms at a time when digital comms were becoming a real thing on the interwebs. And you're like, you are literally saturated in this, in this space becoming, you know, you called yourself a citizen scientist and you are, you are that you don't have to do this and this and this to become a scholar. You can become your own scientist advocate. 
you know, I, I, help me understand for our listeners' sake, you know, the, the digital universe, as you just pointed out, still doesn't quite speak the language of person. And how is that being mitigated from your lens? Um, wow. There's so many things I can say. One earlier, it was really interesting. You brought up the Obama campaign of 2008. Um, my work after brain cancer diagnosis and treatment and then entering the work world was to actually work for a really progressive quasi-political organization that uh, knew and learned from the 2008 Obama campaign, which was focusing on digital community organizing. So I worked with this group of individuals, and then we did more as it led up to the uh, 2012 campaign. So a bit of my knowledge and background comes from online organizing. And as I left treatment, I was inspired to want to use my skills in some way in the healthcare space, but I didn't understand what the connection would be from some web nerd to cancer. And my biggest dream at the time was, ooh, one day I'll go work for a cancer organization and edit their website. Like that was all I could envision that I was capable to do because I am not a researcher. I am not an academic, actually. I don't even have a bachelor's degree. I'm a self-taught person. And what I did naturally as a person living with cancer was start blogging and sharing my experience to a lay audience of my family and friends and learning how to translate these complicated things related to my treatment to, you know, the online, to the interwebs. And I used Google Analytics just to see what people were searching for to end up on my site. And I learned, oh, people want to learn more about chemotherapy or this, that, and the other thing. So I decided to write more about what my audience was interested in, which then in time increased the page views from my site over time. And I realized what people are interested in from me as a person living long-term with brain cancer, it, there could be other ways to communicate this information. So, you know, that led into more of the use of social media, Facebook, Twitter, and, you know, now Instagram. I don't do the TikTok, even though I have a TikTok account. I have accounts for everything, just, just so I can learn. In time, I... I started working for a, a, a nonprofit organization here in California that focused on advocacy, education, and research around advanced care planning, palliative care, and end-of-life care. And I was our communications director. I'm getting somewhere with this. The, the too long didn't read of this was I finally got to work with clinicians, researchers, and realized these people are so smart, but they do not know necessarily how to talk about their research to regular people. And I realized I was this person in the middle who could understand that research and the complicated stuff, but I spoke regular person. And I was spending a lot of time kind of translating things to a lay audience, just like I did with my cancer blog back in 2008 through 2011. It was the same stuff, except now I was a professional at it. Fast forward to where I'm at today. I actually work in academic medicine at for Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, even though I'm in California, and I'm on a specific research project called Open Notes, which has been studying long before I was around, um, but studying the concept of what happens when there's more transparent communication between clinicians and patients, and patients actually read their full medical records. And TLDR, I keep using that acronym, I should explain what it means, but TLDR on that is there are great things that happen when patients have full access to their records. They trust their doctors more. They're more likely to, quote, adhere to their care plan. Um, and they just the offer of transparency is meaningful. I want to go back because you kind of skipped over something really, really important about how you chose to take an active role in the community that you didn't even know you were going to be a part of. And that would be your blog. The Liz Army was like, that was the thing. And like, what is this Liz Army? And like, you dominated content narrative, especially on Twitter at, a, at an earlier time. You were one of the adopters of Twitter before it was the, a fancy thing, before it became like doom scrolling. Twitter had purpose and meaning and value. The Liz Army, you created so much content and so much conversation around what you were going through. You amassed a, a giant following of fans. Where have you seen the impact of that community that you built? I also want to tie that into the fact that you're on the board of directors of the National Brain Tumor Society. What is the wake 
of the impact you've had by telling your story and being so bold? Huh. So the Liz Army is just my Twitter account. In early days of being diagnosed and living with cancer and, and working with cancer, I was afraid for people, I was afraid I'd be discriminated against for using my full name on social media. I didn't want to be found by future employers. So my my Twitter handle is not my real name, full name. I just said the Liz Army. Uh, and, and that's where the name came from, was, was a desire to be anonymous out of fear for future prejudice, I guess. And as a person tweeting about brain cancer and cancer and young adult cancer experience, you, you amass a following of those who are interested in that. As my career shifted a bit, I started working in healthcare. I decided to be open about a person being a person living with cancer. And the, the folks who were following me on Twitter at that time started to pick up individuals who were working in healthcare or interested in the young adult cancer experience from a research side. And then as my work shifted and changed and the things I was talking about changed or the, the conferences I was being invited to change, um, I was, I had more clinicians and researchers following me and I continue to connect more and more with patients outside of the brain cancer experience. I, I feel like I connect more with people with breast cancer sometimes and lung cancer and diabetes and heart disease. So you don't just have to live in your disease specific silo to learn and grow. Really, if you pull a page from the playbooks of other, you know, disease specific communities, you can learn so much more. So my Twitter following or group of folks I connect with is really diverse. There are actually tools you can look at to figure out, you know, which healthcare background people are coming from, from your, your group of followers. And mine is like this rainbow. It's not just, you know, brain tumor patients or researchers or translational researchers. It's a massive group. And I, I, I love that because that's my world is everybody. And I hope for folks who might be following me today on the, these platforms, they recognize that the things I talk about blend into all of those different spectrums. Stupid Cancer was one of the first egalitarian communities. We, we were ageist, yes. but we were egalitarian. And we had this saying, it really wasn't like a, a cover story saying, but it was like, it's not about what you have but it's about what you have in common. And you mm -hmm. have, you know, you, you have basically been the rising tide for so many people who find commonalities and all the messages you're bringing out there. I'm doing a lot of work now in rare disease. And when you're younger, the issues are kind of the same, you know, worrying about your mm -hmm. social footprint for employment and fertility and relationships and insurance and being underinsured and all, all the stuff is the same. It's just through the different lens of your starting point and your finish line. So absolutely very commendable and, and not so surprisingly observed that you've been able to do that. Um, I, I do want to just tie up a loose end here because You've done some Picori work, which is the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute. Lots of syllables with that acronym. You've worked with the National Academy of Medicine. But going back to open notes, there's no way to sum this up in a quick sentence. But to the extent that giving patients this babble fished version, this layperson's version of here's what's actually happening to you. Here are the choices you can make. Here is where you can take what's important to you and factor that into what you'd like to have happen to you. Is that working? Hmm. Is it working? So uh, open notes is the concept of just you have access to all of the information in your record. It's like shared decision making. It's like a, a neologism. There, there's no product for open notes. It's it's the concept of transparency, that you have access to everything your doctor has written about you. And it's legally yours, you know, uh, under HIPAA, actually, we all have the, since 1996, patients in the United States have the legal right to request and receive copies of our medical records. And, and that does not sound sexy, <laughs> but it, it's a thing. And, and if you're a person who's trying to get care or access your records because you were diagnosed with cancer and you're in the middle of, of your closest place for care is a community hospital and you need, need to gather your records to bring them to a cancer settle, center of excellence based off of your specific diagnosis, that process of requesting receiving your records takes time and it takes effort and there are costs involved. And we, we have this legal right to access that information, but it's really hard to gather. And 
I was a person, um, we, we talked about, you know, 2008, you know, first generation patients using digital tools. I fell in love with the patient online portal at my health system. After every appointment or test, I would log into those portals and stare at these metrics and graphs that were depicting various details about what was going on in my body. I, I used the portal to send my doctor's email emails to ask questions and they would respond. I thought that was healthcare. Uh, but in one of your past episodes, Matt Holt talked about the, the emergence of those portals came online around 2005. 2006. So you and I are early generation um, people to use those portals and to learn to navigate our care digitally by connecting with the health system. The thing is about those portals, and oh my gosh, I'm such a nerd, so sorry. But the thing about those portals is hospitals decide what you can see in them. And they don't all say the same thing. So hospital A might say, we're going to allow Liz to look at her complete blood counts, but we're not going to allow Liz to look at her her pathology report. But hospital B across the street in the same town says, we're going to let Liz see everything. And why are those decisions made to to from the top to dictate to individuals what you're allowed to see in your record. Um, there is no uh, you know, national standard to say, give everyone everything. It's made by individuals within the health system. It's very top-down, very patriarchal. And it's also mind-boggling. When you, if, sometimes I like to use a comparison to our bank accounts. We're all used to online banking. We, we log in, we expect that. There's, there's a way you can look at your account results. But what if your bank just said, You have $2,000 in your checking account and you go, cool, I want to see what transactions I had. They're like, no, 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 no. You can't look at the details of the transactions. You can only know that you have $2,000 in your checking and $1,500 you know, in your savings. And if you said, but bank, this is my money. I, it's mine. I deserve to look at, you know, see the transactions and the check clear. Like, don't worry about it. We've got it covered. We're the bankers. We know better than you. That's kind of like what's been happening with our medical records since forever, since we went before we went digital and since we've gone digital. That's the best analogy I've heard. And by the way, you had me at neologism. No one ever says that word. I just, <laughs> that, so for that matter. And also, I fell in love with my patient portal, said no one ever except Liz Salmi. <laughs> so in closing, give a shout out to BTSM. When does it happen? How can listeners learn more about it? And what do they do when they get there? Sure. BTSM, hashtag BTSM, our brain tumor social media is a monthly tweet chat, usually on the first Sunday of each month at 5 p.m. Pacific or 8 p.m. Eastern. It is a group run by volunteers, six brain tumor patients and one neuro-oncologist. We talk about anything and everything affecting those who are living with a brain tumor, malignant or otherwise, we have a lot of fun. We talk about the feels, we talk about research, um, a a new piece of research, uh, anything and everything. It's a great group of folks and you can follow us at BTSM Chat. Awesome. Liz Salmi, I don't even know how to credential you because you're kind of a little of everything, but I'll just say epic unicorn, citizen scientist, neologist, online organizer, and fan of Matt Holt. (laughs) Thank you. It's, It's been really great to be here. I appreciate you reaching out to me. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for joining me. That's all for today, folks. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, follow us on social, and tell all your friends to listen. Out of Patience with Matthew Zachary is a product of Offscript Media. Our executive producer is Matthew Zachary. Our senior producers are Jen Horanjeff and Andrew McDowell. Darren Tun is our production intern. It is recorded, mixed, and edited by Matthew Zachary. Our theme music is by the Mike Van Allen Quintet and by Mara. For advertising and media inquiries, email media at offscript.com. Hit us up at contact at offscript.com to share comments, feedback, and make guest recommendations. For more information, visit offscript.com. 